Good morning. morning. Welcome. I was very tempted, and you'll get this joke if you were here last week, to do something. (laughs) Last week, (laughs) we had a little bit of technical difficulty. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here as your lead pastor. If you're not new, you knew about the technical difficulties. And I told you guys something. I said, after telling a whole story for two minutes without the sound working, (laughs) I said, I'm not going to tell that story again. I lied. I'm going to tell that story again (laughs) this week, just so you get the rest of that story. We're going to kind of continue here in this series and in this story. It was about a little boy who was spoiled, like Adonijah. He was never disciplined at any time. His father gave him whatever he wanted. In this case, a boat. No, not a real big boat, a toy boat. They brought it out to the lake. The father gave the son some instructions. You may want to put a string on this thing. It's a big lake. If it gets out there, you will lose it. Then he goes and he sits on a bench. And then I said the father just kind of sat on his cell phone, and I made a joke, like that's kind of how we parent nowadays, right? In between flicks and apps and all those other things. And if you're checking your phone, that's fine. I'm assuming you're on your Bible app. That's okay. So this wasn't a pointed thing at anyone. It was just a general commentary on parenting. Anyway, the dad's sitting on the bench ignoring the boy. The boy does exactly what we expect him to do. He lets the boat go out on the water without any kind of string, At first it's fun, then the boat gets out on the water and he's losing it. He realizes it and he starts calling for help. The dad, on the phone, ignoring him. He looks over, he sees a man about 50 or so feet away, an old man. He says, help, help, my boat, I'm going to lose my boat. The old man looks at the boy, looks at the boat, looks at the boy, looks at the boat, picks up a handful of rocks and starts throwing them toward the boat. Well, the boy Freaks out. No, don't sink my boat. I need you to get my boat. Dad, help. Tell the old man to stop doing that. Dad reluctantly gets off the phone, goes to talk to the old man. So from the boy's perspective, he sees the father talking to the old man. Or not. (laughs) He looks at the old man, looks at the boat, looks at the old man again. And the boy just sees his dad turn around walk right back toward him, smiling. It's like, the old man's still throwing the rocks. Dad, this is no good. Well, the boy was so focused on the old man that he didn't notice his boat had already come back to shore. You see, the old man wasn't throwing rocks at the boat. The father saw when he got into the old man's perspective that he was throwing the rocks just beyond the boat so that the ripples created by the rocks would bring the boat back to shore. It's all about perspective. As we continue, well, when the little boy saw the boat, he picked it up and he's really excited. He's overjoyed, he's smiling, I got my boat back, everything's great. After inspecting the boat, that joy turned to sadness. Dad observed this, didn't say anything right away. And the boy began to walk towards the old man. And so the father stayed where he was and just watched this whole thing play out. Well, he couldn't tell what the boy was saying to the old man, but he was saying something. And then what happened next amazed the father. He witnessed the boy giving the boat to the old man. He almost cried. I can't believe it. My son's finally gotten it. Well, the boy comes back and he looks sad. So the dad, he's going to preach a sermon, going to make him feel better. Son, that was amazing. You should feel great about what you've done. You've stored up your treasure in heaven. (laughs) This is like better than a hundred boats, what you've just done here. Don't be sad. Well, the boy interrupts the sermon. He says, Dad, I didn't give him the boat. Father's like, okay, I watched you hand him the boat. He said, no, no, no. When I looked at the boat, I noticed there was a scratch on it. It was probably from one of the rocks the old man was throwing. So I told him he had a week to fix it. (laughs) Today we find ourselves 
in the rest of the story. I'll go somewhere with that, don't worry. <laughs> That's all you'll remember, maybe. We talked about discipline. We looked at the story of Adonijah. We ended with David's reign. He's now passed away and passed on the kingdom to his son Solomon. We saw that there's some cleanup work he had to do because David did not pass on that discipline that God put on him. He didn't pass it on to his son. So he has problems with Absalom. Then last week, Adonijah. Tragic stuff. Big problems. He probably should have had more discipline, wisdom, and humility. We're going to talk about wisdom and humility this morning. Today, we find ourselves in 1 Kings 3 through 10 and 2 Chronicles 1 through 9. <laughs> it seems like a lot, but I have something to say about that. We've been talking about this a lot at Bible study. I've been dropping these seeds here on Sunday mornings. The problem in Christianity, as far as the Bible is concerned, is it is like reading or watching, let's say, 10 seconds of a movie at a time. And that's it. That's how most Christians are reading the Bible, the verse of the day. But that is the very best way to get it out of context. We often take these one verses and just apply it to whatever we want. And again, if you watch 10 seconds of a movie at a time, by the time you're done in like two years, <laughs> whatever it would take, you wouldn't get the point. But that's what Christians do. They take the one little line at a time. So it's always better to look at larger sections of text. Sit down and just spend some time like you would a sitcom or anything else. Spend like a half hour reading the Bible. Get the whole book in there and then you'll get the point. So that's what we're doing in this series. But we're taking the time to look at all the little details in the rest of the story that people don't usually look at. Today will be a good example as we look at the life of Solomon of when you look at these larger portions of text, you get the point. And so this is going to be a teaching on Solomon that you're not going to hear a whole lot because people only do like little tiny sections. So why these two sections? Well, if you're new to Christianity or you haven't read the Bible a lot, you might not know that the Bible isn't one continuous flow, just one book, and it goes chronologically straight through. Nope, not even close. In its smallest form, the one that all Christian denominations can agree on, it is 66 books. It's kind of a lot. And some of these books detail the same accounts. They're looking at the same things. So you probably understand four Gospels, right? All basically talking about the same-ish stuff, the life and ministry of Jesus, but gives us different details and perspectives, not contradictions. This happens in the Old Testament too. And so that's exactly where we are. First Kings, Second Chronicles, running parallel-ish. And this is confusing because sometimes they're out of order. Sometimes the author will recall things and snap them in in different places. So to make this easier or less confusing for you, I made a chart. They tell me I got to lean like this in order to make it accurate. But I hurt my back earlier doing that. So I'm not going to do it again. Now, I did make this chart, but I did not draw that drawing. And you can tell that I didn't do it, because if I did it, Cartoon Gene would have much bigger biceps. Anyway, <laughs> just saying, Instagram artist. So, <laughs> you can see here that unlike last week, if you were here, they're mostly in sync. We had a huge section of text in First Chronicles, in fact, 22 through 29, the whole ending wasn't in the corresponding chapters. We went to 1 Kings 1 and 2. So we get, I'm coming into sync fairly well here, but I'll point out the differences. So 1 Kings gives us a little bit more information. There's a couple-ish of accounts that aren't in 2 Chronicles, and so I'll start there and we'll detail them for you. If you're wondering, 1 Kings is before 2 Chronicles. So Kind of makes sense. 1 Kings 3, 1. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around the city. At that time, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings at local places of worship, for a temple honoring the name of the Lord had not yet been built. Now, if you're new, there's a couple things in here that may not be obvious to you. 
But if you kind of know the stories, you'll go, oh, that's weird. Remember, they're in captivity in where? Egypt. You know the Exodus story, even if you've never read the Bible. So that's weird. Why is he doing that? We're going to see later that he's already breaking the rules. So it's kind of funny. You'll smirk a little if you know a lot of this text and go, wow, uh, he's not doing it right. So right off the bat here, no bueno, it's not good. Um, the local places, places of worship, scholars will debate about that a little bit, but they're supposed to worship in the tabernacle. They, so basically, it's like a set-up church, <laughs> if you've been a part of one of those. They have this traveling church that goes around. That's where you're supposed to worship the Lord. So not fantastic here. So Solomon, as the accounts come together in 2 Chronicles 1 and 1 Kings 3, as we keep reading, it says this. He's a Gibeon. 1 Kings 3.3, 3. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. Except, operative word. The most important of these places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed great faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has ever had or I will ever have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world would be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant where he sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then he invited all his officials to a great banquet. If we keep reading, there's a story that a lot of you know. Even if you've never read the Bible, you kind of know this story or you've made reference in your life to this kind of idiom, cut the baby in half. So, there's two prostitutes. It says that they're living in a house together. They go to Solomon for judgment over an issue. So as we saw in this series, people would go to the king with their case. The king is often like a judge. The first woman presents her case. She said, I had a child, I had a baby. And three days later, this woman who was living with me also had a baby. Well, she rolled over on that baby and suffocated it one night. But then she swapped the babies out, giving me her dead child and taking my child. Well, when I woke up, I noticed that the baby was dead. When I could finally see it, maybe some versions will say when the morning light came, I noticed that it wasn't my child. So that's the case. Well, the other woman disagrees. And so they're going back and forth and back and forth. And Solomon finally interrupts. He reviews the case and he said, okay. Bring me a sword. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut the baby in half. I'll give each one of you a half. Well, the real mother, the first woman, says, no, 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 no. <laughs> give her the baby. Her motherly instincts kick in. Solomon knows that this is the real mother. The other woman, cut it in half. Neither one of us will have the baby. And then everyone was amazed at the wisdom of Solomon. If we keep reading and turn the page, we get to chapter 4 of 1 Kings, and we get a summary of Solomon's officials. We see Solomon's peace, prosperity, and wisdom. 
make a note. Solomon has 12,000 horses. Why is that important? Well, we'll see as we go on. Just put that one in your back pocket. 1 Kings 4.29, summary here. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men in the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, and the sons of Mahal, Heman, and the masters of the universe, Calcol and Darda. You have to be my age and paying attention to get that. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs. We'll look at some of those next week. We don't have all of them, and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedar or cedars of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from the cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. Not to the fish, about the fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. What I'm going to do as we approach the rest of the text is I'm going to summarize for you. This is another place where people quit reading their Bibles. It's kind of like numbers when you get there in the Bible or parts of Leviticus. It's a lot of names, details, numbers. It's kind of important, but it's hard to get through. And I'm told that we would like to be out of here by like 11 or 12 today. So <laughs> I'm going to summarize it for you. It, it can be monotonous. I'll just admit that for the regular reader. So we'll get the chart up there and we'll see. So we see that now Solomon is going to fulfill the work given to him. David, remember, another really long section of text. He's gathering all these materials for this temple. Well, now Solomon's going to do it. He's going to build the temple. He makes some further preparations. And so we see that he has interactions with this guy, King Hiram of Tyre. Kind of an important guy. David knew him. Solomon continues the relationship. In Lebanon, there are cypress and cedar trees, so it's good wood to use for the building, especially the paneling. You see that in a lot of these books of the Bible. So they're going to come up with a very complex like shipping route, and they're going to mill all this stuff. So this is where you're finding all of those details in the text. It's a pretty massive project, really big. Solomon pays him with 100,000 bushels of wheat per year and 110,000 gallons of oil, pure olive oil, it says. And it's a huge labor force. 153,600 people are working here. Big. So now, if we keep going, we see that the temple is built. Remember what I said last week. If you convert just the gold for the temple alone, it is a fifth. $15 billion, $600 million project in today's money. Not to mention, it says silver is worthless in Solomon's day. So imagine that. It's massive wealth this guy has. It's unbelievable. The project is huge. Mount Moriah, kind of important place, going all the way back to Abraham. This is where he was willing to sacrifice his son. It's where the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite was. This is what decided where this place is going to be. Important place. So this is 2 Chronicles 3 through 4 and 1 Kings 6 through 7. It begins with this. 1 Kings 6, 1, it was mid-spring in the month of Ziv during the fourth year of Solomon's reign that he began to construct the temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. The temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 40 feet, 5 feet high. Now, keep these measurements in mind. Just stick like 90 feet in your back pocket and remember that. So when we look at the temple, I'm going to summarize this for you too. So there's one picture here. That's uh, just a study Bible that gives us like the outside and the inside. A better picture is that. All right, so we get the outside there. And so what Solomon does, and here I'm going to take 2 Chronicles and 1 Kings and mash them together for you. Some of this stuff kind of happens out of order. We can keep that picture of the temple up just because I'll be describing it here. So he hires a guy, Huram Abai, from Tyre. So it gets a little confusing because it's like Hiram, so people get him switched all the time. 
So the panel on the inside, it's paneled with all this, the temple, I meant to say, if I switched those words, is paneled with a bunch of cypress wood, really beautiful. You know, you make the hangers out of cypress wood if you care about your clothes like me. Anyway, it smells good in there, probably. <laughs> it's paneled with all this stuff. Then it has things like the cherubim, giant wings. They're seven and a half feet each wing, huge, and they're covered with pure gold. So all this stuff is covered with cedar wood and pure gold. Then on the outside, if we can see, you see those pillars. He names them Jake and, and Boaz, and that thing with the cattle-looking creatures there, that's a thing called the sea. It's a big bronze basin, actually, and that's where the priests bathe. There are three of those cattle facing north, west, east, and south, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and later the apostles. And it is also, it can be seen because the priest washed there, is a prefigure of baptism. So everything is representative and carries over to the New Testament. Beautiful. It's worth noting that the altar on the end, well, the altar there, actually, on the outside, it's 30 feet wide. The original altar in the tabernacle is seven and a half feet wide. Remember that number, just like the cherubim's wings. Big, big, huge, huge altar. So another thing to take note of, note of is that this project takes seven years. Seven years to do this and about 15 billion-ish dollars. So if we keep reading, we see something that is not in 2 Chronicles, which is interesting. Solomon's palace, 1 Kings, starting at verse 7. Solomon also built a palace for himself. Remember your old numbers. And it took him 13 years to complete the construction. One of Solomon's buildings, how many? One of one of Solomon's buildings was called the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon. It was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. And so what I'm doing is I'm bringing numbers out of the text that are really important. If you're good at math and paying attention, you probably noticed that his own house was about twice the size as God's house. That's interesting. So we're getting some clues here that a lot of people don't pay attention to. And also, he spent about twice as much time on his house than he did God's house. <laughs> okay. So remember those things. So here the accounts come together again. I'll summarize for you. Second Chronicles 5 through 6, 1 Kings 8. The ark is brought into the temple, the ark of the covenant, finally brought in, and it's this really magnificent worship service, so to speak. God's glory fills the temple. Solomon blesses the people, praises the Lord, and prays to the Lord. When he does, it's hard to catch. You've got to read it carefully. It says he's kneeling. This is really rare for a king to be doing in front of his subjects or anyone. So he's doing okay. But then he dedicates the temple and he stands on a platform, which is seven and a half feet wide. The same width as the old altar, the cherubim wings. So just in 2 Chronicles, something really awesome happens. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes the offering. It says there's so many animals sacrificed, they lost count. So it consumes the offering, a prefigure of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming. We come together again in 2 Chronicles 7 through 8, 1 Kings 8 through 9. Solomon and the people offer sacrifices. We see that they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Feast of Booths, not the Feast of Pentecost. The covenant is confirmed. Again, really important statement. God says, if, <laughs> if you obey my commands, you will prosper. If you do not, then disaster will come upon you. We have just a side note, a little interaction between Hiram the king from Tyre and Solomon. Solomon gives him 20 towns, interestingly, in Galilee. Kind of interesting. He inspects the towns, and Hiram doesn't like them. He's not happy about it. They're probably payment for what uh, he had given Solomon. But he names that place, if you're watching the news, this will be familiar, Kabul, because it means worthless. Kind of interesting. So maybe the Bible was telling us something. Anyway, he pays him 9,000 pounds of gold. It says Solomon's territory increases, but at the cost of enormous forced labor. 
says Solomon's enemies are defeated, so it's a time of peace, but there's a little bit of war, both sides of the coin here. A summary of Solomon's religious practices, economic operations, and leading up to that, another person that you probably know about, even if you've never read the Bible, the queen of Sheba. She hears about Solomon's great fame, it says. That is what, is what draws her to him. So he's wealthy and famous, like a rock star. So she comes to visit. It's this huge entourage with camels, and she's bringing him spices and gold and all kinds of stuff. When she gets there, she said, everything I heard about you was true. It's amazing. Your court officials are lucky just to work for you, to hang around and just hear your wisdom. So she gives him, like Hiram, 9,000 pounds of gold and a whole bunch of spices. Interestingly, he gives her back more than she gave him. So the text summarizes Solomon's wealth. It also says, and this is interesting, debated, that he is taking in 25 tons of gold every year. And that's aside from everything that the merchants and traders are bringing him. So people will debate about what this 25 tons of gold is. In my opinion, and I'll separate that out from fact, it looks like a tax to me because of the way the text reads. So this is what he's taxing the people, most probably. In today's money, $1.5 billion a year in just the taxes, not the income. Remember that for later. It says he has a huge throne like nothing the world has ever seen, overlaid in pure gold with two lions flanking the sides of it and six steps leading up to it with lions on either side, a prefigure of the apostles representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And also, it mentions 12,000 horses again. Hmm. 1 Kings 10.23, so King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year, everyone who visited brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Now, in 2 Chronicles, if we're running parallel, it says Solomon dies. There's a bunch of stuff that happens in between. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of the other works attributed to Solomon and then also where he really messes up. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but we'll stop there for today. You're like, that was enough. <laughs> Solomon was a very wealthy man. God's word tells us the most wealthy man. But God's word tells us that wisdom is better than wealth. Proverbs 16, 16. How much better to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver? Exclamation point. Many of us know how to get riches. Even at a small level, we know how to go out, get a job and get some money. How many of us know how to get wisdom? How do you think we do that? Perhaps by reading? Perhaps, you know where I'm going, people. You've been here for a while. Reading your Bible? That might be a start. We're big on that here if you're new. If you don't like to read the Bible, you might not be comfortable here. Because there are some who have heard the messages here and told me or others behind my back <laughs> which contain many scriptures, as you can see. Here at C3, we like more of God's word and less of Pastor Gene's. <laughs> My opinion is not that valuable, right? So what do I do at Bible study? What he's doing right there. That's what I encourage. I need you to do that. Check my work. I am just a flawed human, nobody, just a mouth here on Sunday. But some say they don't like so many scriptures. They tend to be drawn to opinions more. Have you seen that? A lot of people preaching today. They put up a little bit the verse of the day and then talk for 50 minutes about it. Seems a little upside down. 
Some people will say, I didn't understand that. <laughs> Maybe you would if you read your Bible. <laughs> you know? So the question is, is he your favorite author? Is the author of life your favorite author? I'll submit to you today that I observe just what I'm seeing. Too many people calling themselves Christians who prefer to listen to the world over the word. And as a result, they spend their time spreading the news of the world instead of the good news of the word. I'll lighten it up. So maybe you heard the news that Thanksgiving is canceled. <laughs> I heard this on the news. All right, I heard this on the news, and I'll explain. Don't just wait. <laughs> so I'm going to confess my sin this morning to you, as I do often, not better than any one of you. <laughs> I'm in the Word a lot. That's not my sin. That's a good thing. <laughs> I'm in the Word a lot, a lot, okay? So I, I love the Word of God. I believe that it is my job to be in it constantly, as Paul tells Timothy, right? And Trophimenos. It means constantly nourished on the Scriptures if you're a teacher. It's really, 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 really important. So if I'm not reading it, I'm listening to it. It's on in my house all the time. We didn't rehearse that. All of the time. If you want to hang out with Pastor Gene, you better like listening to the Word of God on 1.5 speed. So, <laughs> it's a lot because I just believe in just being nourished and washed in the Scriptures. But, there's no but there. That's it. But I make a mistake every day for 30 minutes. <laughs> I poke my head up out of the gopher hole and I see what's going on in the world around me because I feel I need to be somewhat culturally relevant, right? You know, I kind of got to meet you guys where you are so I could tell you to stop sinning so much. Anyway, <laughs> I look around and so I turn on the news. It's my news time. I eat my salad and I watch the news. I do something good for me, something bad for me. And so I'm watching the news and they tell me Thanksgiving's canceled because we can't get turkey. Like, there's no meat. You can't get turkey. And so I'm watching, and they're going on, they have like an expert talking about the turkey. It's like crazy. But I'm like kind of getting into it. <laughs> I'm watching it, and I'm like, whoa, right? We're not going to have turkey. And they really got me convinced. They are good, really good at what they do. And so I'm getting a little bit worked up, if I'm being honest with you. My wife, Heather, she comes home, right? And I don't even let her get started, put away things. You got to go back out. I don't see any turkey in your hands. You haven't heard, we need turkey now, or we're not going to have Thanksgiving, right? So she's like, shut up. <laughs> like, turn off the news, right? She knows, right? So here's the problem beside that. This issue makes it all the way to the staff minutes, the next day, because you know? <laughs> she's the one who had to go out immediately and get a turkey. This really happened last week. But guess what? She got a turkey. It was a big turkey, too. It wasn't like a chicken or a, and no substitutes. I made her, and I gave the whole staff a speech about insurance plans, right? So, you know, and that's true. We should have insurance plans for things. But now she's got sliced turkey. She's got a lasagna, because apparently some people like that, too, on Thanksgiving. Everything, right? So she comes. She does the grocery shopping. They like it when I'm wrong. So the next day, Heather goes and gets a turkey. Make sure I see it on the counter and then lets me know I got it for the same price as last year. Talk about accountability. There's a lot of it here at C3 Church. And you know what's really funny? 
when I was watching the news, I was eating a turkey salad. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! And here's what I think. I'm like, hold on a second. I don't want to be boastful. I'm not even going to say how much. I am in the Word a lot. Right? And that happened to me. What? Like, I'm a pastor who's in the Word a lot. And that happened to me. The news is a very powerful drug. And the symptoms are the fruit of the flesh. I see a lot of it, way too much of it. Man, I'm just encouraging you, not scolding you. Get in the word. Turn off the world, man. We're going to see in the series, there's nothing new under the sun. The world... It wants to keep you worried about your stuff. Can we talk about root problem underneath all this righteous indignation that people seem to have? It's about your stuff. Am I wrong? No one's going to say no. Like, or yes, yes, you're wrong, Pastor. Right? Kind of manipulative. But anyway, <clears throat> the world wants to keep you worried about your stuff, keep you consumering everything. But consumerism is antithetical to Christianity, period, period, no but. And it's just so well designed to keep you on that hamster wheel, unreal. It even got me, Pastor Gene's worried about turkeys. Are you kidding me? Like I got to Saturday and I was like, this, I'm going to talk about this because it's ridiculous. The world cannot offer godly wisdom. So when we look to the Word, what does it say about how to get wisdom? I'm glad you asked. New Testament, James 1, starting at verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in every thing they do. The Word of God says we can not have divided loyalties. For as wealthy as Solomon was, this is what the Bible says about wealth, including his in general. James 1.9, believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them does that sound like anything you hear on the news? Let's soak that in for a second. We got a few minutes. Believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them. Blessed are those who are poor. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls, and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. I would put that in parentheses if I was translating that. Solomon became proud in his wealth and achievements. He also let flattery fan the flames that would wither him, and as we'll see, his whole kingdom. But the Word of God says, Proverbs 27, 21, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by flattery. A lot of people who become wealthy become prideful. And this is because the world tells you that pride's a good thing, doesn't it? Not what the Word of God says. It can lead you to believe that you know everything. We've got a little bit too much of that, don't we, nowadays? It can tell you, you know what you're talking about. Especially if you think that your wealth or achievements confirm it. 
Listening to the world can make us arrogant, prideful in our knowledge, in our achievements. The world says that pride is a really good thing. We should be proud in our wealth, proud in our achievements, our positions, our titles, blah, blah, blah. The world tells us that these things, I see a lot of this, make us better than other people. Proverbs eleven twelve. 12, but the word says, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. There's the key ingredient. Humility. We must live with humility. We shouldn't let our wealth, if we have it, or accomplishments, the things of this world, make us proud or turn our hearts from God. Humility is wisdom. And if you've been a Christian for a while, you know this. We sometimes, like Solomon, seem to or maybe start out things right and then we start getting it wrong because of the world. Solomon seems to have started out okay, and that's usually the account you hear when you don't read the full context, right? He's so humble, he asks for wisdom, so God gives him other stuff too, and that's what we like. But we got some hints. He married a foreign bride, sacrificed to idols. That's not great at all. So the full context gives us the full picture. Then as we read through, as I pointed out, he builds a better house for himself than the temple of the Lord. Oh, but I did it first. <laughs> Ooh, do we do that? Oh, but I, I put God first for an hour on Sunday. <laughs> and then I make my house greater than the Lord's. I see it happening. You see, with his mouth, he was saying one thing. But with his actions, he was saying, my house is bigger than God's. Solomon also taxed the people heavily. 25 million, yeah, million tons, tons of gold. Or 25, yeah, tw no, 25 tons of gold, excuse me. $1.5 billion. Not good at math, that's what my wife is for. <laughs> Had to check my notes. 25 tons of gold, I'll clarify. About $1.5 billion. This is worth noting. It's a conversion. The Bible converts numbers for us a lot because we don't measure things the same way. But if we read the original, that number, 666 talents of gold. Worth noting. And we'll see that all of this leads to disaster for the future kingdom. As we saw with David, it began with his pride. Solomon continues with his pride and his wealth and his achievements. If we don't stay humble, or you can lose our wealth, if we have it, or worse yet, our wisdom. If we go to the law of Moses, and I'll uncover something for you as we close this morning. He wasn't really supposed to have all this stuff. It's kind of interesting. If we go back 400 or something-ish years to the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 17 says this. You are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. Not the ideal. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses, like 12,000 of them, for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses or get a foreign bride. <laughs> the king must not take many wives for himself. We're going to see that problem later, like 1,000, because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. That's the point. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver, so much that it's worthless, and gold for himself, like 25 tons, or 666 talents every year. 
When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way, he will learn to fear the Lord God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way, and it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. It is a mixed blessing that he received, perhaps a test. Did you notice it says he's to be in the word how much? Every day, all the time because it will prevent him from thinking he's better than his fellow citizens. Maybe we should take a cue. Perhaps being in the Word all the time would prevent us from thinking that we're better than our fellow citizens out there in the world that we're supposed to be getting the good news to. We can't let the world turn us away from the word. It's about keeping Jesus at the center and not letting our Christianity become corrupted by the world. Bottom line. We must look to the true king for our example and those who are true disciples of him, like James, his brother. Also, Paul gives us some good writings, and we'll close here on this thought from the word of God. As Paul writes to Timothy, he talks about wealth. 1 Timothy 6 says some hard stuff that we'll talk about at Bible study, but he says flee from those things. Flee, run away from wealth. You and I should just be content with food and clothing. We're good. But he knows as churches do today, we rely on benefactors to help us get the gospel out. So they're important too. He writes this, 1 Timothy 6, 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. With whatever we've been blessed with, we must be generous with it, humble about it. In our blessings, we must walk in humility and remember who they came from and give glory at all times to the giver. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this church. It is the people in it. I pray that you move them by the power of your Holy Spirit into a wild generosity that we see in your word, that they would be kind and generous, displaying the fruits of the Spirit wherever they go, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Fill us with your Spirit, Lord. Empower us greatly to do your work, to be vehicles of your love and the good news. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.